La Rochefoucauld is certainly right when, in the most noteworthy passage of his self-portrait, first printed 1658, he warns all those who possess reason against pity. When he advises that it be left to those people of the commonality who, because their actions are not determined by reason, require the passions, if they are to be brought to the point of aiding a sufferer, or energetically intervening in a case of misfortune, while pity, in his and Plato's judgment, enfeebles the soul. One should, to be sure, manifest pity, but take care not to possess it. For the unfortunate are so stupid that the manifestation of pity constitutes for them the greatest good in the world. Perhaps one can warn even more strongly against this having pity if one understands this need felt by the unfortunate, not precisely as stupidity and intellectual deficiency, as a kind of mental disturbance that misfortune brings with it, that indeed is how Lou Rochefoucauld seems to conceive it, but as something quite different and more suspicious. Observe children who weep and wail in order that they shall be pitied, and therefore wait for the moment when their condition will be noticed. Live among invalids and the mentally afflicted, and ask yourself whether their eloquent moaning and complaining, their displaying of misfortune, does not fundamentally have the objective of hurting those who are with them. The pity which these then express is a consolation for the weak and suffering, inasmuch as it shows them that, all their weakness notwithstanding, they possess at any rate one power, the power to hurt. In this feeling of superiority of which the manifestation of pity makes him conscious, the unfortunate man gains a sort of pleasure. In the conceit of his imagination he is still of sufficient importance to cause affliction in the world. The thirst for pity is thus a thirst for self-enjoyment, and that at the expense of one's fellow men. It displays man in the whole ruthlessness of his own dear self, but not precisely in his stupidity, as La Rochefoucauld thinks. In the conversations of social life, three-quarters of all questions are asked, three-quarters of all answers given, in order to cause just a little pain to the other party. That is why many people have such a thirst for social life. It makes them aware of their strength. In such countless but very small doses in which malice makes itself felt, it is a powerful stimulant to life. Just as benevolence, disseminated through the human world in the same form, is the ever-available medicine. But will there be many honest men prepared to admit that causing pain gives pleasure? That one not seldom entertains oneself, and entertains oneself well, by mortifying other people? at least in one's own mind, and by firing off at them the grape-shot of petty malice. Most are too dishonest, and a few too good, to know anything of this pedendum, and they are welcome to deny, if they like, that Prosper Merame is right when he says, Sachez aussi qu'il n'y a rien de plus commun que de faire le mal pour le plaisir de l'affaire. Know, too, that there is nothing more common than to do evil for the pleasure of doing it.